All right. Thanks, Dr. Sasson. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. David Madoff is next up. He is the Interventional Radiology Chief, uh, Vice Chairman for Academic Affairs, a Professor of Radiology, and he's at Weill Cornell Medical College. Please welcome Dr. Madoff. I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for still sticking this out. Um, it's always nice to give talks in New York, because then I can always say that I'm not related to Uncle Bernie. I'm sure he is somebody's uncle, not mine. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the uh, details again about neuroendocrine. You're all here, and you all understand uh, what we're talking about. Of course, the uh, total incidence is increasing, and obviously the uh, median survival does depend on histology, with well-differentiated being uh, much better in terms of survival than uh, poorly differentiated tumors. Um, this was a study that was shown by uh, James Yao. Uh, while uh, while um, I was at MD Anderson, I had worked at MD Anderson 10 years before coming you know, in Houston, before coming to, uh, to Cornell six years ago. And ultimately, this shows a, a numerous uh, patients that were treated with uh, neuroendocrine. And ultimately, the bottom line is that uh, the, primor the primary uh, mortality is really based on organ failure. And ultimately, um, the idea here is that you really need to have local control of the tumor. And as was stated by the previous speaker, the poorest prognostic variable is liver involvement. And you know we see a lot of patients that come to my office, and they have both liver and lung tumors, for example. And ultimately, they always ask, why can't I also treat the liver? The, the lung tumors in addition to the, to the liver, but ultimately at the end of the day, the, uh, the lung tumors really don't have much in terms of prognosis, so we really uh, most often leave those alone. So I guess first of all, the question is, what is interventional radiology? I'm not sure how many in the audience, maybe by a show of hands, really know what an interventional radiologist is. So maybe a small handful of you. So what I decided to do is give you the Wikipedia definition. I sometimes need to give this to my parents because they also don't really know what it is that I do. And sometimes when explaining to people at parties, it's just easier not to really say too much other than just to say I'm a radiologist. But uh, as was also said, uh, radiologists, a lot of radiologists don't necessarily see patients. Although at Cornell, uh, we do have it where if you are interested in having your films explained to you, because a lot of times nowadays, all the information about um, your um, reports are online, and patients actually don't understand a lot of what would be in them. So uh, we actually have a service where the radiologist, the diagnostic radiologist, that is, will in fact uh, go over your reports uh, with you. So as far as the definition of an interventional radiologist, it's a medical subspecialty of radiology which utilizes minimally invasive image-guided procedures to diagnose and treat diseases in nearly every organ system, and that includes the brain. Uh, the concept is to diagnose and treat patients using the least invasive techniques currently available and to minimize and improve health outcomes. And ultimately, sometimes there is a, is, is a um, it is unclear uh, when I say that I do a lot of treatments whether we are really a specialty of radiology or we're a specialty of radiation oncology. So I just want to make sure you're all aware that interventional radiology, or IR, is not radiation oncology. Uh, we do see patients in our office the same way that any other physician, such as an oncologist or a surgeon, would see you in their office. So I do have office hours and clinic time the same way. And uh, it's not ultimately, and you know, in the past, it has been that interventional radiologists have just been doing procedures, and that's all they did all day. But nowadays, it's gotten to a point where we really have a lot of uh, critical uh, decision-making responsibilities. So what is the role of interventional radiology, and especially as it pertains to metastatic neuroendocrine tumors? We're involved in really the diagnosis of patients and in the treatment of patients. So as far as diagnosis, image-guided biopsies are essential. And in fact, it's been suggested that in the next uh, decades that the role of biopsies in terms of getting genetic testing and for pers personalized medicine, that image-guided biopsy may be the most uh, important thing that we do. When I was at MD Anderson, we used to do about 20 patients or more a day uh, just on that part of our service, and we had a whole other service that had nothing to do with biopsies, 
and then also treatments. So we're involved in primary adjuvant and neoadjuvant tumor therapies. We're involved in a lot of handling of post-operative complications or GI endoscopy when they have complications. Uh, we do nearly all the central venous access. So if you need a port, we're the ones that place that. And also, there's a lot of palliation we do. So if patients are um, not uh, failing to thrive, for example, we do a lot of gastrostomy tubes, nephrostomy tubes, treatments of GI bleeding. So there's a whole host of uh, types of procedures that interventional radiologists uh, deal with. As I had already alluded to, image-guided biopsy is essential, and it's going to become even more essential in the future. And ultimately, uh, lots of services, you know, in, interventional radiologists intersect with almost the entire hospital. There are very few fields or specialties within the hospital that we don't intersect with, and it's largely because of the biopsies. And because we do so many of these biopsies, we get a lot of referrals for other types of procedures, such as treating uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumors. So this is just an example of a patient who has multiple uh, liver tumors. Uh, you can see here, let me see this. But here's a, see a bunch of tumors uh, within the liver. And ultimately, we're able to see on ultrasound uh, the liver mass, and the liver mass is shown by this hyperechoic area between the arrows. And it's very simple to just place a needle into the tumor and get tissue, and then ultimately the, the um, pathologist can uh, do a, a whole host of marker studies, and we can find out exactly what it is. And this is particularly true in the setting of what we had already talked about, which is unknown primaries, where it's essential to try to figure out what type of tumors patients have. So I just wanted to go over a lot of different types of procedures, a lot of different types of cases. This is, these are patients with neuroendocrine liver metastases that have localized disease. And what I mean by localized disease is that there are very few tumors relative to other patients that we had already seen uh, today. So here are patients. Uh, I, I apologize if you can't really see the tumors very well. But uh, the first one uh, to the left is one that was treated with thermal ablation with a single solitary uh, liver nodule. Uh, the second patient, the middle one, uh, had metastatic carcinoid, and that was treated with gland embolization. I'll get into what that is. And then the third patient with um, another type of a neuroendocrine tumor actually had surgery. So here we see very limited disease, but at the same time, they had three completely different types of procedures. Now we want to move to what's called diffuse disease. And here we see, similar to the uh, previous speaker, where on the left, the patient has innumerable numbers of tumors. And that patient was treated with what we call chemoembolization. There's another patient in the center, also with numerous tumors, that was treated with what's called gland embolization. And then there's another patient on the, on the right, which was treated with, with, with uh, radioembolization. So I want to go into each one of these modalities and try to let you know and establish how we actually come up to using these types of procedures and whether or not they're even indicated in particular scenarios. So as was uh, previously stated, uh, the goal of therapy is really cytoproduction. Although these uh, patients uh, do have uh, cancers in what's called slow motion, uh, if not treated, uh, the five-year mortality does approach approximately 80%. So the goal is really to uh, decrease the tumor burden and facilitate uh, symptom control. So when looking at what um, are the indications for image-guided therapies, uh, there's a number of them. Uh, symptoms despite medical therapy. So although medical therapy has gotten better and although there are a number of new agents coming down the pike, uh, patients still uh, develop symptoms despite having these new drugs. Um, deterioration of liver function tests. Now, liver function tests are, a, are um, an indic indicator of how much normal liver is left underlying. So if a patient has really severe liver function test abnormalities, these patients may not be, be able to be treated by any type of therapy, but if a patient's starting to have, uh, going from normal to in increasing deterioration, then this may be a patient that would require some kind of intervention. A progressive tumor burden, and that can lead to bulk symptoms. So for example, if a patient has a very large left side of liver mass and it's pushing on the stomach, patients are unable to thrive, that may be an indication. And then preparing patients for hepatic resection is, is another indication. So which therapy should we use? Um, we look at disease location and extent. Now, ablation is usually reserved for small tumors, uh, less than three centimeters in size and less than three, in the setting of other types of tumors. But in the setting of neuroendocrine, as has already been shown, that may be different. It may be used with, with uh, in combination with surgery. 
the regional treatments are really used with diffuse bilobar disease and in situations where the tumor is in a very difficult location to treat by any other way. We look at tumor histology to understand whether this patient would actually benefit from chemotherapy at all. We also need to understand procedural and technical considerations, which may be beyond the scope of this particular um, venue, but it's still when you're interacting with your interventional radiologist, it is important for them to tell you why this particular procedure would or would not be the best option. And then, of course, patient preference. So uh, we do, believe it or not, uh, consider patients as, as, uh, in, in the decision making. I think it's important that they're on board with whatever you decide, and I think that it's important to have forums like this in order to really educate, educate uh, the consumers. So there's multiple local regional treatment options, and we used to go back and forth at this, at, uh, at this uh, at tumor board, and it was always interesting when the surgeon would always say that the surgery, said surgery is actually local regional therapy as well. And in fact, that's true. So if a patient does a, hep hep uh, a um, hepatectomy where they're removing part of the liver, that is technically considered a, a local therapy. There are numerous ablative techniques, which we can get into a few of them. And then I will get also into all the transarterial therapies. So first and foremost, there's a lot of barriers to liver resection. And not every patient is eligible for, for resection. And a lot of this has to do with the number, size, and location of the liver tumors. Uh, we also need to look at the size of the liver that's going to remain after the surgery. So we know that the liver has the ability to regenerate, and because of the regeneration, you can actually uh, remove approximately 80% or more of, uh, approximately 80% of the liver, and patients still do fine. Uh, we need to understand about extra hepatic disease, and we also need to understand whether or not patients can tolerate some kind of uh, major surgical procedure. So this is one example of conversion of a patient uh, to resectability, and this was done with arterial embolization. This was a 71-year-old woman with a single carcinoid tumor that's shown uh, here, oops, shown here uh, by, by the arrow. And this is in a very difficult location uh, for ablation. Um, the idea here is that the patient uh, was, very, was, um, was very malnutritioned and ultimately would not be a good candidate for surgery based on the, on, on the poor performance status. We also can see that there's some uh, biliary obstruction, which you can see that all of these um, lines there um, represents that the tumor is pressing on the bile ducts, and ultimately this patient uh, was, had a poor performance status. So we did embolization of the tumor. The tumor did get smaller, as evidenced by having less enhancement of contrast within it, and then the patient was ultimately uh, able to gain 30 pounds, uh, had a high, a, a, an improved performance status, and ultimately had a very large resection. This is an extent left hepatectomy where approximately 70% of the liver was removed and had a very uneventful uh, post-operative course. There's another procedure that we do in interventional radiology uh, to get patients from unresectable to resectable, and this is called port uh, preoperative portal vein embolization. Uh, this is a patient, a 55-year-old man with multiple metastatic carcinoid tumors within the liver. Uh, this patient uh, did not have any extra hepatic disease and did not have any tumors within the left lateral liver. Uh, and this is just um, the left lateral liver here. So as you can see, the plan of resection is very, very, is very large. And ultimately, um, as, I had, as I had stated, about 20% of the liver needs to remain in patients that have what you would consider normal underlying liver. That is, patients that don't have cirrhosis or have not been treated with high-dose chemotherapy. Uh, this patient, when you measured the liver volumes, had a 15% future liver remnant, or FLR. So this was a patient that we wanted to try to regenerate their liver prior to surgery. So as I had stated, this is what's called preoperative portal vein embolization. Um, this procedure actually redirects portal blood flow directly to the future liver remnant. By doing so, it allows the liver that's going to remain after surgery to hypertrophy or to regenerate prior to the surgery, okay? And by doing so, we're able to reduce the number of overall perioperative complications, and we can increase the number of potential surgical candidates who have what we call marginal anticipated future liver remnant volume. So without this procedure, the patients may not be eligible for surgery because they may go into liver failure due to the small size of their liver remnant. And ultimately, the goal here is not necessarily to get, I mean, 
it would be better to have better uh, survival, but the goal is really to match the survival of patients that would otherwise have had surgery had they had a normal sized liver or a better uh, sized liver remnant. So here we can just see that uh, this is the portal vein coming, uh, this is the vein that takes all the blood back from the gut into the liver. This is the left portal vein here. This is the right portal vein here. And we are able to basically um, block up the blood supply of the veins going to the lobe of the liver that's going to be removed, that part of the liver will actually atrophy. And then the part of the liver that will um, remain is this here. It actually grows uh, before surgery. So ultimately, this patient had a FLR of 15%. And after a month after the procedure, we were able to increase their liver volume to 24%. So uh, this patient was able to undergo successful surgery and have no um, complications. And here you just basically see oops, the, uh, the resection as well as all the tumors within the liver that was uh, removed. So this patient did very well. It's very important for everybody that gets these kinds of treatments to really understand the definitions. When I first arrived at Cornell, uh, now it's been about six years, uh, we, we had tumor board, and it was very easy for a lot of the people at the tumor board to, when, when reading through histories, to say that this person underwent TACE, or this person underwent this or that, or microwave or RFA or whatever, but they were actually wrong in what they were saying, because if you look at the actual details of the procedures that we do, it was not correct. So I think to avoid confusion, it's imperative for the physicians and the patients to understand the, the uh, various treatments that are offered. So a lot of the terminology, as I had stated, is often used interchangeably. So people use chemoembolization when it's really bland embolization. They use bland embolization when you actually give chemotherapy. Um, they talk about, you know, the, or they request radiofrequency ablation when you actually did a microwave ablation. Now, a lot of these may not really matter in the overall scheme of things when presenting a patient at tumor board because ultimately what you see probably is pretty similar. But it, is, it does have major implications when looking at you know, if you want to switch doctors, for example, uh, having accurate uh, medical record keeping, uh, it's better for patient care to really understand what is going on and even for billing purposes. So there's numerous uh, local ablative therapies, and they all have different mechanisms of action. And I'm not going to go through this whole laundry list here, but it's basically to just uh, show you that there's lots of different types of procedures that are, that, or, or different um, modalities that could be used to achieve the same thing. And if you look at kaplan meyer survival curves, which is, one, which is actually what we really want to look at when we're talking about um, you know, overall and uh, the disease-free survival, you know, they're pretty similar depending on which ablation device you use. I still think, though, it's important to really have an understanding of which one you do use because it may actually, like I said, affect, affect things. So the goals of locally ablative therapy are to really eradicate all viable malignant cells while sparing normal surrounding tissues. The idea is to also treat tumors with unfavorable location or pattern of distribution for resection or patients that have um, multiple comorbidities. So in the early days of interventional radiology, a lot of the patients that we had seen were ones that uh, were easily ablatable but also could have surgery. And ultimately, because of their comorbidities, such as severe coronary artery disease or, or, or others, they ended up having an ablation procedure. And then over time, it was found that a lot of the ablation technologies were equal in terms of survival and recurrence rates as surgery. So then it now has become much more um, advocated and is now incorporated into many of the NCCN guidelines uh, with surgery. And also, uh, in terms of locally ablative approaches, it's most often used in patients that have low volume disease. So most of the uh, published literature is on radiofrequency ablation. And this is not necessarily to say for neuroendocrine tumors, but for uh, all tumors in general that affect uh, the liver and other organ systems. So radiofrequency ablation, I don't want to go into all the details about it, but basically you place a probe or a needle into the tumor and you hook it up to a generator and ultimately it cooks the tumor. Uh, and this is just an example of a patient, a 53-year-old uh, man who underwent resection of a small bowel carcinoid who then developed a single uh, 1.9 centimeter liver metastases on follow-up and that's uh, shown by the arrow. Uh, I would believe that this would be a pretty extensive surgery uh, based on its location posterior in the liver. Um, 
And however, you know, when, when, when doing the uh, ablation, it's actually a very simple procedure and it's similar to doing a biopsy where you just place the needle to the location, turn on the generator, and as you can see in this case, three years later, there's uh, no tumor recurrence. Microwave ablation has largely surpassed RFA based on the fact that you get much faster uh, ablations, uh, larger ablations, and there's also a lack of the need for um, grounding pads, which used to be needed with radiofrequency ablation. Uh, if they're not placed properly, these pads, uh, for radiofrequency ablation, you can actually get skin burns. So there's been a, lot, a, a move away from radiofrequency ablation, which was really the first iteration of, of, heat, of heat ablation compared to microwave ablation or, or other types of ablation. And this is just an example. Uh, this was a 76-year-old woman with a solitary metastatic somatostatinoma status post Whipple that has a single uh, right liver metastases, as shown by the arrow. Uh, you can see this was done with ultrasound and, 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 and um, CT guidance. So this is ultrasound. You can see the needle placed directly into the tumor. And ultimately, we had uh, two needles next to each other. We got a large burn. And ultimately, uh, 18 months later, there was no, uh, no viable tumor. Now, when you're talking about ablation, uh, a one centimeter lesion turns out to be, or I should say a one centimeter tumor turns out to be a three centimeter ablation. Okay, so typically with um, hepatocellular carcinoma in the setting of cirrhosis, those patients only need a 0.5 centimeter burn. So a one centimeter tumor will actually be a two centimeter um, burn. Um, but when you have metastatic disease, it's really, you want a one centimeter margin around to basically um, allow the, uh, to have a successful ablation and reduce the rate, the rates of recurrence. So if you go to someone and you see them and they, and they tell you that, uh, you know, you have a one centimeter um, tumor, you're going to end up really with at least a three centimeter ablation zone. Cryoablation is used in many different organ systems, but it's very rarely used in the, in the liver. Um, this is a mechanism where you actually cool the tumors as opposed to heat them. And cryoablation has been shown to have some immunolo immunological effects. Uh, there are many advantages, which include that you can see the ice ball very well, where with uh, thermal ablation is very difficult to see. And also, um, the ice is a natural anesthetic. Uh, however, in the liver, there's um, increased risks of bleeding and cracking the liver. And there's also an entity called cryoshock, which uh, ultimately is based um, in tumor lysis. And patients can get uh, really sick after doing these types of cryoablations and increase uh, risk of hemorrhage. So for that reason, cryoablation has really fallen out of favor uh, in the liver. So most of what we do, and most of the patients, so, so those patients that had ablation are not the typical patients that we see. It's really the patients that have the much larger volume disease. And these patients ultimately undergo transarterial therapies. And the reason why you can do this is that normal liver, 20% of the liver is supplied by the hepatic artery, which comes off the aorta, the main artery in the abdomen. And 80%, or 75 to 80%, is supplied by the portal vein, of which I kind of already went into. However, the tumors themselves are largely, if not almost 100%, supplied by the artery. So if you treat the artery, you still have a large amount of blood flow to the liver, but the tumor gets effectively treated. So there's a number of different types of transarterial therapies. There's what's called transarterial arterial embolization, or transcatheter arterial embolization, or bland embolization. There's transarterial chemoembolization, or what we call TACE. There's chemoembolization with drug-eluting beads. I'll get into that. And then there's some radiation based therapies, which include Y90 radioembolization. For all these procedures, it's really important, as was stated uh, by one of our earlier speakers, to have prophylaxis for carcinoid. Um, these patients uh, can get very, very sick and get, go into hypertensive crisis from the carcinoid. And it's better to have this under control prior to the procedure than to deal with it emergently in the, in the um, interventional uh, radiology suite. This is also a reason why a lot of patients with um, neuroendocrine tumors, and in particular carcinoid, get admitted after the procedures, whereas with other types of tumors, they may uh, not be admitted. So just to go over the different types of em embolization procedures, uh, again, bland embolization is embolization without chemotherapy. 
Now, embolization is a procedure where you go into the groin or into the arm. Now there's what's called the transradial approach, which uh, is now advocated by a lot of uh, different groups. And patients like it because you can get up and walk around right after the procedure. Um, ultimately, the whole goal is to get a catheter, or which is a small tube, into the artery supplying the tumors in the liver, do a lot of do some angiograms to define the anatomy, and then uh, administer whatever type of therapy that you had planned on. So, and I'll show a, a bunch of examples of that. So bland embolization is embolization without chemotherapy. Now we all know what a pulmonary embolism is, or you all heard about you know, PEs. Well, it's kind of a similar theory. So, so a pulmonary embolism is a clot that then breaks off from the lower extremity, or, or technically it could be the upper extremity, and ends up in your lungs, lodged in your lungs. Well, that's not something you want, okay? But here, you're purposely blocking up blood supply to certain areas. And this is in the same set, this is also done in patients that have um, lower GI bleeds where you can go in with catheters and plug up tiny little arteries instead of having to have major bowel surgery. So it's a similar concept where you get a catheter to the area of the tumor blood supply, you infuse uh, some material, and that material ultimately clogs up the tumor blood supply and um, A, decreases, at least in the setting of carcinoid tumors and, and other types of neuroendocrine tumors, De uh, decreases the blood the, the, the tumor blood supply, shrinks the tumor down, and ultimately reduces the, um, the hormonal release that you can have. Now, initially, you get an increase in the hormonal release just because the tumor is fighting against the, um, the reduced uh, blood supply. But uh, ultimately, the goal here is that we have multiple different entities that we can use, or different agents that we can use. There's no chemotherapy given. The idea here is to completely occlude tumor feeding vessels. By doing so, we can cause ischemia. Ischemia, you probably know in the heart, is a heart attack. And then ultimately cause necrosis, and that way it kills the tumor. So this was just a patient that uh, with neuroendocrine uh, metastatic disease to the, to the liver. And in this case, we were, you can see there's tumors all over the liver. And interestingly, they're quite hypovascular, meaning that they're not highly vascular. But this patient was not really being treated for um, for, uh, I mean, obviously, you treat, you treat patients uh, to reduce tumor size, et cetera, and to improve overall survival. But in this particular case, the patient was having abdominal pain. And you can see that there's a tumor here that's lying on the uh, liver capsule. And that can cause pain. The, the, um, the liver capsule gets inflamed, and it can, uh, th there's a lot of nerves that um, are supply the liver that then shoot to the arm. So if you have a, ever have a liver biopsy and you have pain in, in the arm, in the shoulder, that may be a slight amount of bleeding that's around the liver. Anyway, in this case, this is an angiogram. And here we see the, um, it's a celiac axis. This is the splenic artery, the artery going to the spleen. This is the um, uh, common hepatic artery. This is the artery, this, the gastroduodenal artery that then supplies part of the bowel. This is the hepatic, um, the pro what's called the proper hepatic artery. Then you have the left and right um, hepatic arteries. And in this particular case, the, the tumor was supplied by the right hepatic artery. And we used some microspheres to plug up the uh, area. And you can see, oops, you can see at the end of the, um, the angiogram shows that there's material in these arteries. And the, um, there's, there's no flow beyond that point. So in this particular case, the patient's um, tumor that we were trying to achieve uh, completely necrosed and the pain actually subsided. This is another patient, 53-year-old man with carcinoid liver metastases who is suffering from uh, flushing and diarrhea, diarrhea with an elevated chromogranin A despite uh, long-acting sandostatin therapy. Uh, the patient underwent four rounds of bland embolization. Uh, this was the um, Pre, so you see these multiple large tumors, and after four rounds of the embolization procedure, the tumors got much, much smaller, and the symptoms greatly uh, improved. And I'm missing the word improved, but that, I, I was trying to add it in, but uh, it improved after the embolization procedure. So the advantages of arterial embolization are that the materials are readily available. All interventional radiologists understand how to use these, use, use these um, agents. It can be um, 
can be repeated numerous times. So these particles themselves do not really affect the arteries, unlike chemoembolization or radioembolization. There's no systemic chemotherapy effects because there's no chemotherapy given. Typically, insurance preauthorization is quick, and almost every carrier will allow for, for this. And these are usually performed with moderate sedation. Now, in these particular situations, uh, because you're looking for ischemia, uh, these can be quite painful. So patients are often admitted for these procedures. Um, and again, in the setting of carcinoid and other types of neuroendocrine tumors, you could get a massive um, hormonal release. So that's why I would suggest if you're doing bland embolization for carcinoid tumors, for example, that patients uh, be admitted. Conventional taste or chemoembolization is where you infuse a mixture of chemotherapeutic agents, uh, and, and, and it can be within what's called um, iodized oil or the same embolic agents that you, um, that you have used for bland embolization. This is a very difficult um, entity because many institutions may do it very differently. So with a lot of the other uh, procedures that we do, there is some standardization, but in this case, it's all a heterogeneous mixed bag. So uh, there's a lot of times when we'll use oil, other places won't use oil, the oil is a carrier. It's done very, very differently. And ultimately, the idea here, and, and we don't even know if uh, the, you know, should you use one chemotherapy? Should you use a combination cocktail chemotherapy? Which chemotherapy should you use? It's, it's, it's very all over the map. And uh, as I said, multiple embolic agents have been used. And this is a patient that we treated a long time ago. This was, um, you know, again, has innumerable tumors. And ultimately, after two sessions of chemoembolization, where only the left side was treated with streptozosin uh, chemoembolization, you can see that the tumors on the left side actually are much less than what was seen here and compared to the other side. So um, ultimately, this is, a, a, I think, a very reasonable approach. So again, the advantages of conventional taste are, again, that the materials are readily available. We can get very selective into the hepatic circulation, so you can actually uh, treat tumors very, very close to their origin and try not to uh, embolize non-target areas. Can be repeated multiple times, but I don't believe it can be repeated as much as bland embolization because the chemotherapy does injure the arteries. Again, insurance is uh, quick. And again, usually performed with moderate sedation. Again, some of these patients, as far as disadvantages, may require hospitalization. Um, if, it, if the disease is extensive, and we see a lot of patients like this, it requires multiple types, multiple numbers of treatments. Uh, the chemotherapy itself could be toxic both to the um, tumor arterial supply, but also it does get somewhat systemic. So it is important to understand that. And again, Patients have uh, a chance of having a, a rapid um, hormonal release and, again, may end up requiring um, yeah, hospitalization. This just shows some survival data. Again, I wouldn't focus necessarily on the survival data itself because there are patients that, like, as you heard, can live years and years and years. So these are all like median survivals. So just because uh, you know, the median survival is 33 months in many of these or 39 months, that doesn't mean that you will only have 39 months if every patient is different. Uh, we did a study during my days at MD Anderson uh, where we looked at carcinoid and islet cell in terms of chemoembolization and bland embolization. And we found that uh, as far as response rates go, the carcinoid uh, responds uh, better to bland embolization, while islet cell uh, responds better to chemoembolization. Now, at the end of the day, does response rates really matter? Probably not. What's really more important is the overall survival. So there was no difference in overall survival between TACE and uh, bland embolization. So at MD Anderson, and to this day, we still do it that way, it's still done that way, is that for carcinoid tumors, they do not add chemotherapy. However, the opposite is true for patients with, with, uh, with islet cell uh, metastatic disease. Now, this was a study that was performed subsequently from University of Pennsylvania. And they found the opposite results in that for both carcinoid and metastatic uh, endocrine and neuroendocrine, that uh, adding the chemoembolization was, uh, in fact, better. So it's kind of hard to know what really to use. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to make a, a prediction on what uh, should be used in any particular patient. 
Drug eluting beads is another um, one that I had mentioned. This is where, uh, we, again, chemo uh, with, with traditional or conventional chemoembolization, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the way it's done. The idea here is that you can use these beads, fill the beads with chemotherapy, and then have a more um, predictable uh, route of administration. So you can see from these graphs is that when, when you're talking about systemic therapies or systemic, um, when, when the drugs get systemically, that the conventional taste is a high bump in systemic uh, therapy, whereas with the, with the beads it's low, and obviously what you want is low. So the idea here is that you can do uh, embolization, use the chemotherapy, but have a much more predictable uh, benefit. And this here shows the difference where with chemotherapy, the chemotherapy goes all over the body, right, systemic. With taste, it's less so. And then with drug eluting beads, the idea is that the chemotherapy stays within the liver. And this is just a paper that was published in the Journal of Vascular Interventional Radiology uh, now about uh, eight years ago which just shows a tumor being completely uh, necrotic after the convention, after the uh, drug eluting bead taste. Uh, this is the time course of toxic events. So with all these types of therapies, there's what's called post-embolization syndrome. And patients get elevated white blood cell counts. They get fever, pain, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. And usually it's very self-limited. However, with the setting of uh, drug eluting bead taste, the uh, pain and the nausea and vomiting is actually quite soon after. However, the uh, fever and not wanting to eat and things like that actually is delayed compared to the other types of modalities. And interestingly, when looking at Deb Tase, I would only use Deb Tase in the setting of cirrhosis uh, in patients that have neuroendocrine or colorectal metastases where the liver itself is normal. The um, chemotherapy over time continues to leach out and ultimately will damage a lot of the surrounding normal tissue, as you can see uh, by this slide here. So this is what the tumors look like, very small amount, but now you have a much larger zone of destruction. So in this particular case, the advantages are similar, okay, but the disadvantages are that uh, you may get delayed side effects. Again, uh, a lot of the disadvantages are similar as well. And of course, the question is, in the setting of neuroendocrine cancer, is the chemotherapy that you're using, which to this day is either doxorubicin for certain types, for most types of liver cancers that we treat, or renotecan, which is used for colorectal metastases, whether the chemotherapies that we're using are actually appropriate. So lastly, we just want to discuss what's called radioembolization. Still give me one time. So uh, with radioembolization, it's a little bit different. This is not acting by ischemia, but it's acting by radiation by, by, by radiation itself, there's two agents. Uh, there's therosphere and surosphere. Therosphere, the indication is uh, humanitarian device exemption for hepatocellular cancer. And these uh, pr procedures are always done under the setting of an IRB. Uh, surospheres is actually approved for colorectal cancer, but it is FDA approved, so you can use it uh, at will without uh, using it under an IRB. So if you came into my office, Today, I can actually say, let's, let's use it. But uh, not, that's not the case with, with Therosphere. The idea with Therosphere also is the composition is different. The number of spheres um, is much less with Therosphere, um, actually uh, much, much less, which means that in order to get the same activity, you need to have each particle must be a lot hotter uh, per unit sphere, OK? As far as um, the differences between bland embolization or chemoembolization and Y90, um, with, with, with the radioembolization, you do need mapping arteriograms. Um, you also, uh, it's also typically an outpatient procedure. So even if you do have carcinoid, you could actually treat these patients as outpatients. And ultimately, compared to um, the endpoint with uh, bland embol or chemoembolization, where I said it's very heterogeneous, it's actually quite homogeneous in the setting of Y90. And here I just wanted to show um, some ex an example. This is um, an arteriogram where, uh, you know, similar to the other types of procedures, for a mapping study, the, the, you, you do give um, radioactivity, but the radioactivity is not in of itself a treatment, okay? 
the idea here is that you want to make sure that there's no activity in the lungs or as little as possible. So here we see that there is a lot of activity in the liver, which is here, and very little in the lungs. So that patient would be considered a go. However, in this case, there's a lot of uptake in the lungs and not as much in the liver. So that patient would probably not be a good candidate for radioembolization. We also need to make sure there's a lot more technical details that need to be done with radioembolization. Here we see some uptake in the stomach right there, and these are the particles in the, in the, in the, in the stomach. Uh, ultimately, these patients um, can get very bad ulcers if you don't embolize these patients in advance to make sure that, they're, uh, that there's not any flow going to the stomach. And these ulcers are actually much worse than ulcers, the typical ulcers. Typical ulcers are mucosal ulcers, and they're easily treated. These are actually from the inside out and are actually much, much more painful and difficult to treat than standard ulcers. Uh, we do a lot of embolization of extrahepatic arteries. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all these details. But ultimately, you need to uh, treat the arteries going to the stomach if you see them. And most of the time, they come off the left hepatic artery. This is a system that we, the delivery system. It just shows that uh, the radio, radioactivity is within the tumor. Uh, there is activity that does go to the liver. And uh, as far as the rest of the body, very low activity. This just shows the response in a patient with neuroendocrine tumor uh, before and after therapy. And this is at a different level. Interestingly, uh, you can see that there's some nodular appearance of the liver here, which wasn't seen here. So a lot of these patients do end up getting radiation-induced liver disease, which is very rarely talked about. But it can, in fact, happen. Uh, this is a case that I wanted to show of a 53-year-old man with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and numerous uh, liver metastases. Here we see tumors throughout both uh, lobes of the liver. This is the mapping angiogram. So this is on day one. This is the first procedure. Again, this is a mapping study. There's no treatment involved. And you can see that there's multiple, uh, these, all these little circles are all tumors. We then are able to get um, catheterized the right hepatic artery and the left hepatic artery. And we inject technetium uh, 99M, uh, five millicuries. And ultimately, uh, let me just uh, skip through this. In this particular patient, we were trying to get into the right gastric artery to embolize it, not to get to, to avoid stomach ulceration. However, it was impossible the way we were doing it. We actually had to go into the left hepatic artery around to the right hepatic artery. And you can see that even going through the artery supply in the stomach, there's contrast here, which is actually the stomach artery, the um, hepatic artery. And then you basically place coils there to prevent uh, embolization to the stomach. And this is the, the example of this. So this is how it looks. Every patient goes down to nuclear medicine to make sure that the material went to the right place and that we ruled out the uh, lung shunt fraction that we discussed briefly and anything going to the stomach. And this just shows um, where all the material went. So this is hard to read, but ultimately there's, oops, there's, two, there's um, uptake in both the left and in the, uh, the right lobes. So that looks good. Lung shunt fraction was 14%. So uh, these patients really needed to be lower than 20% in order to really uh, not get complications such as radiation pneumonitis. So on the day of therapy, this usually happens a week later, you can see that, again, there's many small little balls that indicate the, uh, the tumor supply. We treated the right side first. And um, we then looked at the what's called the Bremschelung scan, which shows where all the radioactivity went. And being that we treated the right side, all the hotness is on the right side, which is good. And then we brought the patient back a month later and then did the left side. So this patient did very, very well after um, one year, although you can start to see that there's a little bit of fluid anterior to the liver, which we'll get into in a second. So these are just some results uh, from the earlier work showing median survival of about 70 months after 185 treatments. This shows that the comogranin response, comogranin A response uh, goes up really briefly and then comes right back down. And that in terms of imaging response, about 91% of the patients were able to get some at least uh, imaging response uh, for the uh, procedures. And then this slide, I just wanted to show that despite the fact that we are doing these procedures, you can have uh, either radioembolization 
after chemoembolization, or you can even have chemoembolization after radioembolization. There's, just because you had one type of procedure doesn't mean that you can't get another type of procedure. And uh, the advantages here are that usually this is done as an outpatient, unlike all the other procedures. Uh, it's usually performed with moderate sedation, and the patient that I just showed actually only had that done with lidocaine. They didn't have any sedation at all. Um, it is well tolerated. Uh, the most common um, side effect is fatigue, and there is less pain associated with this typically than with the other types of embolization, and that there is a slower release of hormones relative to the other types of procedures where you're truly trying to cause necrosis. The disadvantages are that the materials are not readily available, so you can't just take them off the shelf on day, you know, at, and, and, and uh, like, like with the other types of procedures. The two companies are based in Canada and Australia. So if you wanted to use the Surspheres, it would take you about a week to get the material once you, you know that you're eligible to become a candidate for that. The insurance preauthorization does take some time. And usually these procedures are done low bar. So in, typically you would do a whole right and a whole left lobe as opposed to some kind of chemoembolization or emboli other embolization procedures where you can do much more focused types of uh, treatments. Just in terms of side effects, um, this is a, a list. Uh, again, I had already mentioned post-embolization syndrome, where patients do get sick after procedures with, uh, with the chemoembolization type procedures. Um, you can go in, get into hepatic insufficiency. Um, I'm not going to read you the whole list here, but suffice to say that uh, this is a study from 1999. Uh, in 2016, the numbers are much, 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 much better, and it's very rare that you would get much more uh, worse side effects. These are long-term side effects. This is more due to the chemotherapy than anything else. But I think that uh, it's still important if you do have tumors that are eligible to be treated this way to have it done. As far as radioembolization, like I said, one of the things that we want to avoid is ulceration to the non-target areas, such as the stomach. Again, these are very, very painful and often happen much later. So this can happen up to like two to three months after the actual uh, embolization procedure happens. Uh, we wanted to spend a second talking about radiation-induced liver disease. In my opinion, I have stopped using a lot of radioembolization in younger patients. And younger, I mean even in the 50s and 60s, because you expect a very long, uh, typically, life expectancy. These procedures are not done more than one or two times. So uh, you know, it, it, it is a complicated situation. I read a lot of papers that say that there's, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of the papers that I have read say that there's no radiation-induced liver disease, but I can't possibly imagine that being true. Um, it does cause fibrosis of the liver, and I already showed you a couple of examples where that is the case. And I'll show you in a second this case here, which was a patient that I showed earlier that had very good results. So in this case, the patient had excellent tumor control after a year, and three years has excellent tumor control, but now uh, has cirrhosis with a very, very nodular appearing liver. So this patient died three years after uh, radioembolization, and he was 50 years, 50 something years old. So I um, am very hesitant nowadays to use in the setting of neuroendocrine a lot of uh, radioembolization because again, you can't, and this is only after one treatment with each lobe. So in conclusion, uh, neuroendocrine metastases treatment should be individually tailored. I do believe that these uh, all should be done or interpreted in a multi in, in, multidisciplinary group. I think that every patient is different, as I explained, and that there does need to be more research involved in this type of disease because it's very unclear uh, which uh, procedure is better for which type of uh, disease. It is important for cytoreductive therapy, and I think that's been hopefully discussed uh, ad nauseum. Uh, each therapeutic modality does have advantages and disadvantages. And I do believe that you should go to a place that has a high level of expertise, because you've already heard from Marianne and others that you can go seven or eight years being completely uh, wrongly diagnosed and not get any real benefit uh, from, from, uh, from not being at a high volume center. And I think that it's also important to discuss treatment options in detail with your family and physicians, uh, which therapy may be best for your circumstance. So with that, I'll conclude.